Hi, I'm the History Guy. I love history, and if you love history too, this is the channel for you. When you think of the most famous mobsters in American history, you might think of names like John Dillinger or Al Capone, and think of mob cities like New York and Chicago and Las Vegas. But the quad cities along a turn of the Mississippi River along the Illinois-Iowa border probably don't come first to mind. And yet in many ways, John Looney, the Quad Cities Vice Lord, was the prototype for an American mob boss. And at one time he ruled over a vast empire of bootlegging brothels and protection rackets. Various types of organized crime started appearing in the United States, primarily among immigrant communities, at the end of the 19th century. But the rise of organized crime in the U.S. was largely associated with the prohibition of alcohol with the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1919. While it was originally assumed that prohibition of alcohol would reduce crime, attempts to enforce prohibition resulted in the rise of criminal gangs, who became more sophisticated and more violent as they combated federal agents and other criminal organizations to control the lucrative bootlegging of illegal alcohol. This would give rise to vast organizations, eventually spanning the nation, and powerful crime bosses who would control and sometimes fight over territory. Because of the relationship between alcohol and other vice, these gangs would often control other criminal activities like gambling, prostitution, and protection rackets. And to protect those networks, they would often subvert police and elected officials. Perhaps the most famous of the Prohibition-era bosses was Alphonse Gabriel Capone, who controlled a major crime organization in Chicago. Because of his many donations to charity and his flamboyant personality, Capone was seen more as a national celebrity than a criminal, at least until the public's mind was turned by the violence of his activities. But Capone, who took over mobster Johnny Torrio's organization in 1925, was by no means the first mob boss of his kind. Well-known, connected, controlling vice over vast swaths of territory, using violence, and yet still keeping the public's attention. Now, if there was a prototype for the Prohibition-era mob boss, it was arguably a man whose territory was some 160 miles from Capone's Chicago. The area today known as the Quad Cities was originally populated by an Algonquin-speaking tribe called the Sauk. Sauk tribal leader Black Hawk, who led the Sauk in a conflict over land in 1832 that was called the Black Hawk War, was born there. After Black Hawk was defeated and the land ceded, communities grew along the riverbanks at the Illinois-Iowa border, where a short bend has the Mississippi River running east to west. The area was an important point for riverboat trade, and so grew in the area of industrialization. In 1848, John Deere, who had invented the first commercially successful steel plow, moved his manufacturing business there. In 1856, the first railroad bridge across the Mississippi River was built there, and a lawsuit concerning that bridge went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and built the reputation of a young lawyer named Abraham Lincoln. By the turn of the 20th century, the cities of Rock Island and Moline in Illinois and Davenport across the river in Iowa were calling themselves the Tri-Cities and had a combined population of over 120,000. And the city of East Moline was growing enough that the name would soon change to the Quad Cities. Patrick John Looney, known as Patty John to his friends, was born in the small town of Ottawa, Illinois, in between the Quad Cities and Chicago, in 1865 to Irish immigrant parents. He started working at a young age, as was common at the time, and worked as a railroad telegrapher. That job moved him to the town of Rock Island. There he became interested in the law and studied for the bar, passing the exam at the age of 23. By most accounts, he was not very successful in the courtroom, but practicing law did put him in contact with the criminal element of the Quad Cities, many of whom would end up owing him as they could not afford their legal fees. Looney first ran afoul of the law in 1897, when he and his law partner were implicated in a scheme to defraud the city in the building of a storm drain, selling, it was claimed, inferior materials. While there were eventually convictions in the case, they were overturned on appeal. The case was important in that it taught Looney that there was money to be made in graft, and the connections that he made in the deal offered him an opportunity to get into the field where a criminal could really thrive in Illinois, politics. Looney became a leading figure in the local Democratic Party using machine party tactics that eventually put him at odds with the local Democratic newspaper, the Argus, a rivalry that would last throughout his career. When he ran for State House of Representatives and lost, he blamed the editorials that had been written in the Argus, he acquired a printing press and in 1895 started his own paper, the Rock Island News, billed as the only truthful paper in Rock Island. It turned out that journalism provided as much opportunity for vice as politics. The newspaper was a scandal sheet that he used to attack his enemies and to blackmail people. Authorities were cowed as his paper could destroy their career with a lie. Even as he carried on the war of words with the Argus, his paper allowed him to found his criminal empire, operating both a brothel and illegal gambling out of the same building where the paper was printed. 
And of course, customers of those businesses were also then vulnerable to blackmail. Between his connections and his blackmail and extortion, he was able to avoid convictions for the many libel suits brought against him. But the game went sour in 1912 when Looney took on the powerful mayor of Rock Island, Harry Shriver. Apparently Shriver had refused to intervene in a trial of one of Looney's henchmen, and so Looney went after Shriver in the news, accusing him of all sorts of misconduct and affairs. In response, Shriver had the paper shut down, had Looney arrested, and once arrested, Mayor Shriver himself beat Looney so badly that he had to be hospitalized. In response, Looney supporters agitated a riot in the streets that eventually included as many as three or four thousand people. Significant damage was done to City Hall, and police returned fire, killing two people. The governor declared martial law and sent 600 National Guard troops to restore order. Looney left the area, although his lieutenant stayed around, but returned in 1921. Prohibition offered new opportunities, and his empire grew. He ran bootlegging in brothels, illegal saloons, his protection rackets, and an auto theft ring. He revived the news and its dirty tricks. Reportedly, Looney had as many as 300 prostitutes as his employ, all under his madam, Helen Van Dale, who was called the Queen of the Quad Cities. Van Dale carried on an affair with the Chief of Police and essentially ran the department. One of the favorite tactics was to have one of Van Dale's prostitutes leap into the arms of a local politician while one of Looney's newspapermen took a picture, and then the politician would be subject to blackmail for fear the picture would show up in the newspaper. Ironically, with so much money to be had, Mayor Shriver became a co-conspirator, and Looney controlled both the police and powerful politicians. At one point, he had as many as 150 gambling dens and brothels under his control. That was larger than Johnny Torrio's Chicago operation. So many local citizens patronized his illegal establishments that they essentially became immune to prosecution because to do so would implicate the entire town. But cracks started to form in his organization. A former henchman, fired over a fight with Looney's son Connor, over a girl, gave evidence to federal agents. Then a saloon owner named Bill Gable, angry that Looney had increased his protection fee, handed over checks to revenue agents signed by Looney. When Gable was gunned down in the street, the Rock Island police, in Looney's pocket, blamed outside gunmen. But the rival paper, the Argus, refused to let the matter slide and kept asking, who killed Bill Gable? But Looney still managed to avoid prosecution. Then, on October 6, 1922, another disgruntled saloon owner named Anthony Bilberg and several other men attempted to kill Looney. Looney was not hit, but his 21-year-old son Connor was killed, shot multiple times, as well as a bystander. Despite being represented by the famous attorney Clarence Darrow, Bilberg and three of his associates were convicted in the murder of Connor Looney. Bilberg's granddaughter still claimed to own the gun that he used to commit the crime. But the violence was Looney's final undoing. Feds raided his businesses. He was indicted for transporting stolen property as part of his car theft ring. And then, in answer to the Argus's question, he was indicted for the murder of Bill Gable. Mayor Shriver and Police Chief Cox were also indicted on conspiracy charges. Looney managed to escape arrest for a while by hiding out with his relatives in Ottawa, but he was eventually captured in New Mexico. He was convicted in 1925 and sentenced to 14 years. He served eight and a half before being relieved for health reasons, but never returned to Rock Island. Patrick John Looney died of tuberculosis in 1947. And while he was not as famous as many other mob bosses of his era, he's still a legend in the Quad Cities, where you can get tours of his hideouts and haunts. Looney was the inspiration for a character in a 1998 graphic novel called The Road to Perdition, which was turned into a film in 2002. The name was changed to Rooney, and he was played by actor Paul Newman. But that character is entirely fictional, as the events all take place in the 1930s, long after Looney's organization had collapsed and he was sent to prison. Looney's violent rise and fall was emblematic of the era of the gangster in America. While the nation and Hollywood has somewhat romanticized the era, it was in fact violent, expletive, and often quite gruesome. Organized crime would become even more violent over the period of Prohibition and the Depression, and many mob vices would rise who would become much more famous than John Looney. But in many ways, Looney was the first, the prototype for a Prohibition-era mob boss. His organization was larger than Papa Johnny Torrio's organization in Chicago, with whom he had some criminal connections. And his rise and fall came even before Scarface Al Capone took over Torrio's organization and became a mob boss himself. If for no other reason than he was the first, the model for an era, the infamous Quad Cities Vice Lord deserves to be remembered. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series of short snippets of forgotten history about 10 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button, which is there on your left. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. And if you'd like more snippets of forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.